Uh, good morning, afternoon, or even evening, depending from where you are connecting. My name is Marta Osorio. I work for the uh, Food and Agriculture Organizations of the United Nations. And I work as a Gender and Rural Development Officer. Uh, I have been working for the last 10 years in uh, gender and agricultural investments in issues related to gender and then tenure and uh, gender sensitive uh, agricultural policies. So welcome to this webinar uh, on climate change and gender in the <clears throat> cocoa and coffee value chains. This is the second of a series of three webinars of the Cocoa and Coffee Initiative. So for those who did not attend to the webinar, let me give you a brief overview of the initiative. In 2016, FAO, the Royal Tropical Institute KIT and TWIN joint efforts to build on their respective and complementary knowledge and expertise to put in place the cocoa and coffee initiative. So basically the aim of the initiative is fostering gender equitable value chains, that it is value chains that take into account the differentiated necessities of women and men and that consider those uh, so that they equally can benefit from. But also at the same time, the initiative aims at transforming gender relations at various levels. All this is under the base on the assumption that both women and men uh, participate in the production, processing and marketing of cocoa and coffee but that uh, the benefits that women get from their engagement is generally lower than that of men. So, but why cocoa and coffee sector? What, what, why we have chosen the cocoa and coffee sector as an area of interest? And so basically they are uh, three different uh, reasons because the first is that there is evidence that women face similar issues in both chains and that various actors involved in the value chains also experience similar gender constraints. Uh, also because there is a variety of actors in both sectors that have uh, manifested their interest and adopt measures and approaches for promoting gender equality and empowering women as a way of um, increasing their benefits and ensure their future sustainability. So having said that, let me just briefly uh, tell you what are the objectives of the initiative. So the first one uh, and first and the second one, I will say they are related to the knowledge generation and it is the identification of innovative approaches, strategies, and the systematization of good practices that can be, can be shared and disseminated. Then there is, uh, so basically, uh, an objective related with, with the collaboration and partnership. So it is the idea of creating a spaces of dialogue among a wide, a wide range of actors. So in order to facilitate the knowledge exchange, but also uh, to foster collaboration and partnerships. And then the last one is related with, with the capacity development. So it is uh, to enhance the gender related capacities of the different actors so that they, they can uptake and scale up the, the good practices. Uh, just to finish, I would like just to mention that uh, since the, um, this uh, partnership with uh, KIT and TWIN started, we have carried out uh, different activities. The first one was uh, a multi-stakeholder consultation 
in which we brought about uh, 50 participants from uh, the both sectors. Uh, we count with the participation of producer organizations and cooperatives, policy makers, uh, multinational enterprises, um, uh, service providers, academia, certification schemes. So based on that, we, we create this space of dialogue and exchange of knowledge and, and experiences. And then as a result of this uh, initiative, then uh, we focus on systematizing uh, some good practices uh, and innovative approaches that have been implemented by uh, some participants that attend this multi-stakeholder consultation. Basically, uh, based on that, we uh, conduct uh, a, a workshop with eight of these organizations, again, representative of uh, uh, different uh, stakeholder groups, and uh, they reflect on, on their experiences and share these, uh, the approaches and strategies that they have been implemented. And as a result of, of this sharing of experience and knowledge, uh, so we systematize those and uh, that paved the way to a publication that is entitled The Change in the Terms of Engagement in the Cocoa and Coffee Sector, that actually was officially launched during the first uh, webinar of this series of webinars. And lastly, this series of webinars that we are in the second one, and then uh, about in a month, uh, we will have the final one, but there is one of our uh, team uh, uh, members, that Anna, that then will provide the details uh, before the end of this webinar. So with that, uh, I really thank you, all of you. I also would like to acknowledge the, the huge participation that we have up to now. We have about 70 participants. And so I think that this recognizes the importance of, uh, of this issue. And, and so I hope that, that you will be, and you really will enjoy uh, this webinar and that you will contribute to the discussion. So now it went over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marta, indeed, for welcoming everyone uh, to this webinar. My name is Ewen Le Bon. I am Knowledge Management and Communication Advisor at Kit Royal Tropical Institute, one of the uh, institutes involved in, in this project and in this webinar series. Uh, I will help moderating today's webinar on the topic gender and climate change in cocoa and coffee. And before I explain briefly what's going to happen this afternoon or in this hour and a few minutes, uh, let me just add a, a couple of technical things about this platform we're using, Zoom. Uh, just to mention first that we expect everyone to keep being muted throughout the entire webinar, obviously with the exception of our speakers at the right time. Um, and we will, yeah, if we need to, we will use the power to actually mute or unmute people. We have uh, one of our staff members on the Air Force who has, who has that power. When the Q&A time comes, so question and answers after the presentation, we will, however, invite you to raise your hand uh, and speak up, or if you prefer to use the chat box to post your question. And you can actually post questions throughout the webinar. We will make sure we collect them and uh, hand them over to the, to the speakers. Um, we also will not feature video throughout most of the webinar, with the exception of the speakers at, at times, particularly during the Q&A session. Uh, and of course, as for any webinar or web meeting, everyone has that experience, things unexpectedly happen. So just please be patient and uh, supportive with us and understanding. And we hope for the best optimal experience for everyone. This webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be made available alongside documentation about this whole uh, webinar, including presentation and, uh, and additional publications. So for now, here is the flow uh, for this webinar. After this short welcome, I will invite Becca Morahan, whom I'm going to introduce also very briefly, to actually introduce our speakers. And then Kathy Farnworth will uh, introduce the topic a little bit more formally, why we're talking about these topics, followed by the main speaker, Fortunate Pasca, who will present experiences from the coffee sector. 
we will invite some response from Anna Laban from Kit, uh, particularly sharing also the cocoa sector uh, experience and side of things. And, and after that, we will basically host half an hour of question and answers for all of us, all of you. And finally, we will have some closing remarks from Anna about next steps and, uh, and just some take homes from this particular webinar. So now let me hand over to Becca Morahan, just introducing her. Uh, Becca is a consultant working on gender in value chains. She worked as an associate at TWIN for many years and was a partner on this initiative that we are featuring or that is featured in this series. Becca has particular experience of working with household met methodologies and on women's integration in cooperatives, as well as of documenting best practices. And with these words, Becca, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. Um, so yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers and I just wanted to say a little bit more as well about how we came to choose this topic. So um, our first webinar, as Martha mentioned, was mainly launching our publication. So we, we spoke about the publication as a whole and we focused on a couple of cases and we used that opportunity to to think ourselves about what are the emerging issues um, that we could use the last two webinars to, to really delve into that are of relevance to the cocoa and coffee sectors today. So we wanted to kind of use the publication as a, as a jumping off point to then to, to really discuss things which we're currently grappling with. So we, we tested some of our ideas as a team with the, the people who attended last time. And we also listened out for themes which emerged naturally in the discussion and it seemed that there was some good momentum behind this topic of, of the relationship between work on gender and work on climate change adaptation and mitigation and we originally for this webinar we were we intended to have two speakers um, and sort of maintain this direct comparison between coffee and cocoa but we found actually it was interesting we didn't come across a cocoa case study which really had this clear dual focus obviously there's an enormous amount of great work happening in gender and cocoa, there's a lot of work happening on deforestation, but we in the end didn't find um, an experience which we could share, which was really integrating those two, although we may not have found it yet. So if there's anyone on the line that does know of one, that would be very interesting to hear. But we thought actually it's a nice opportunity to, to really go into depth in one case. So we have, um, as you and mentioned, we have a coffee case, which we think and hope is of relevance and interest to those working in both sectors. And we also invited Cathy Farnworth um, to come and give us an introduction conceptually to this, these sort of two areas of work and how they relate to each other. So Cathy will start us off. And Cathy, for anyone who doesn't know, is a researcher with over 20 years experience of working on gender and agriculture, um, including coffee. And in recent years, she's been researching and publishing um, on this topic of the transformative potential of, in particular of household approaches to, to gender equality and the relationship between this work at the household level on co greater cooperation between men and women, household planning and visioning and, and work on climate change adaptation, which is obviously such an urgent issue which is facing us all. And then we will hear from Fortunate Pasca. So Fortunate um, has be, is working currently with the Hansa Neumann Stiftung um, Foundation. She is a gender expert with, with over 15 years experience, a background in gender and human rights, and she's based in Kampala. And so she um, has particular expertise in, in the household approach, which is used by HRNS, which is also featured in our publication. So if you're interested in finding out more about it, um, there's, there's some information about it there. But we, what we've asked Fortunate to focus on particularly today is how they've integrated this household approach into their work on climate change. They have a, a program, uh, Coffee and Climate, and um, so she will tell us about the relationship between these two, two areas of work. So yeah, so with that introduction, I will now hand over to Cathy. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I've got three slides, so I'll ask Andrea just to move on by saying the word next. Okay, so the first slide. Currently, um, systems in coffee and cocoa and in agriculture more broadly are often treated separately in many agricultural interventions. However, the climate crisis, and I prefer that term as do many because climate change makes it seem like something gradual and possibly quite pleasant is happening. Um, the climate crisis is a huge systemic problem. 
which affects the ability of agricultural systems to function effectively right now and into the foreseeable future. The climate crisis is already affecting the ability of households and of women and men in those households to manage their agricultural systems, their farms and coffee plantations effectively. All of these systems are dynamically and iteratively connected with complex feedback systems and operation. However, one big problem when we're trying to help farmers manage and adapt to the climate crisis is in a way we are thinking. We think the crisis is out there, but there's also a crisis in the way that we think about these issues. We can be very limited because we plan interventions based perhaps just on the farm or just on the household. And we tend to have different experts, specialists for each part of the whole system. So for example, we might work with gender expert, experts to work with the household only, agronomists to work on farms. Then we might um, invite climate experts to model climate systems. So this presentation and the next one by Fortunate is about bringing two components of this huge system together, the farm system, and the household. And today we're talking about using gender equality methodologies as a mechanism for that. So next slide, please. All right, so let's look at the farm, um, the household system. Starting at the top left, households. We already know that households can be sites of gender inequalities. They're not necessarily um, unitary systems. So households can be sites of gender inequalities. These inequalities mean that the household does not work very effectively as a system because people are not necessarily collaborating very well. The way in which a family plans its farm and how it deals with the climate crisis, crisis might not be effective. Um, let's just go quickly through this diagram. So um, livelihoods can differ by your gender. Men and women have different responsibilities, crops on the farm. Um, as a consequence, their knowledge can differ. Um, their gender interests can differ. Just on gender in interests, this is about the needs of women and men in a particular system in this case. For example, just to move um, outside cocoa or coffee, in the fish value chain, um, men might be fishing on open water and might need to improve their capacity there. And women might need better information on processing and marketing fish. These are examples of gender interests and the same relates to coffee and cocoa. Um, benefits can also differ from this farm system and this leads to strategies of cooperation and conflict in households. So gender interventions are about strengthening cooperation and when you strengthen cooperation you also strengthen the household as a decision-making system. If you don't do that you can have negative um, systems outcomes. For example, uh, climate risks differ for women and men because they grow different crops, work with different livestock, use different natural resources and so on. Because women and men have different adaptive capacities, their vulnerability to risk is different. We already know that women and men are not reached equally by the extension services, for example, or that they participate differently in markets. So the cl climate change has a different impact upon women and men. And I was just thinking very briefly about the locust invasion in Kenya. We can see that that is affecting men's livelihoods as well as women's livelihoods. So it is not that women and men, that men are not affected negatively by climate change. They are affected as equally as women. It's just that those, those effects might be different. So taken together, the household is not an effective learning system. And they cannot necessarily develop and implement effective iterative, by which I mean learning strategies to adapt to the climate crisis. So next one. So when it comes to gender equality, let's think of it as having all hands on deck. Everybody has a capacity in the household to deal with the climate crisis. 
If you bring those systems together, gender equality can feed into climate smart agriculture and improve the farm household's capability to adapt. Working on gender equality methodologies can help farmers improve their forecasting skills. They need to be able to predict what is happening and to learn from what is happening now, improve their learning skills, improve their planning skills, and hopefully through gender equality methodology, methodologies, we improve their innovation capacity. So thank you very much. Before we move on, I just want to hand over to Fortunate. She's now going to give us a case study from Uganda on how they brought the household system and climate smart technologies and coffee plantations together. Thank you very much, Kathy, for setting the stage for my presentation. My name, once again, is Fortunate Pasca. I work with Hansa and Yuma Stiftung, a non-profit foundation that promotes sustainable livelihoods for coffee farmers and their families. Um, the foundation implements uh, a holistic livelihood uh, approach, as you can see on the next slide, which has different components, but with gender as the basis of all these components. Uh, having said that, I now move to the next slide to talk about the different components, coffee and climate, and the gender household approach that were implemented separately before uh, combining them to address uh, the issue of climate change. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the coffee and climate uh, initiative that we started implementing in 2010. And uh, the initiative uses a step-by-step -step participatory approach to support co-farmers adopt to climate change. And the first phase of this uh, coffee and climate initiative was implemented in Central America, Brazil, Tanzania, and Vietnam. Uh, apart from the coffee and climate initiative, uh, the foundation has also participated in other multi-stakeholder programs focusing on climate change, such as the Global Climate Change Alliance, spearheaded by FAO. And currently, we are implementing the Feed the Future Alliance for Resilient Coffee project supported by USID. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the gender HRNS approach. Uh, the approach promotes joint planning and decision making within the households, with particular emphasis on joint decision making on the utilization of household income. Impact in this approach is multiplied by identification of change agents who serve as role models by demonstrating the benefits of transparency, collaboration, and joint decision making between husbands and wives in the entire community. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Both this coffee and climate uh, and the gender household approach were successfully piloted in different HRNS pilot countries. Uh, however, when we conducted an evaluation at the end of the coffee and climate phase one, uh, we realized that the existing gender gaps could affect the sustainability of, of the results. We could already see that there was limited participation of women in the coffee and climate initiatives, and also there was limited adoption of climate smart technologies. So we decided to uh, come up with an initiative that we have piloted, which integrates the key elements of the gender household approach into the coffee and climate approach. Uh, as you can see on this slide, this uh, integrated approach has different elements. The first one, we conduct uh, a gender sensitization of the pharma organizations. Pharma organizations are very key in providing services to the farmers. So we really want them to provide gender equitable services to the farmers. So we support um, the pharma groups to be able to analyze 
their systems, analyze their constitutions, analyze, analyze their structures to identify gender gaps and come up with uh, strategies to address uh, the gaps. Uh, one of the issues uh, these farm organizations look at their uh, constitutions and see whether they, the clauses in these constitutions allow equal participation of women, for example, in leadership. And one of the strategies, um, they come up with quotas, which uh, provide some form of affirmative action for women to participate in the leadership structures of these organizations. Um, we also do a sensitization for the coffee and climate uh, teams. We know that they are the frontline uh, people in uh, training our farmers in adopting climate smart uh, practices. So we uh, build their capacity to be able to analyze their activities, the work that they do, be it uh, assessments to identify the uh, climate uh, change effects on coffee and the farmer households, to be able to come up with um, uh, strategies that are gender responsive in the work that they do. We also build the capacity of our extension teams to be able to um, integrate concepts of household visioning and planning, which is a core component in our gender household approach, to be able to support um, the farmer households in their trainings, in the farmer field schools, to come up with household plans that also integrate climate change adaptation options. Um, we also support these teams to be able to analyze uh, gender situations, especially in terms of the timing, in terms of the location of their trainings, such that they are able to provide suitable uh, conditions for both men and women to participate in climate change uh, trainings and uh, activities. Um, we also realize that addressing the, the gender relations within these households may not be enough. We really want to also come in and address the practical needs of these uh, households, especially for the women. Um, so in addition to the key elements of the gender household approach, we also uh, promote uh, energy we, we promote energy saving technologies for the households and also for the, for the farms. And this of course is aimed at reducing um, the time that is spent on domestic work, especially like for looking for firewood or looking for water and also to reduce on the exposure to elements that could be a health hazard to some of these households. We also know that uh, some of these resources are very scarce. So we want to uh, reduce the dependence of, on these resources, which are also becoming even more scarce with the advent of, of climate change. So when we go to the next slide, you, you, you're able to see some examples of these climate smart technologies that uh, we, we implement. On this slide, you can see the energy saving cook stoves. This is a metal cook stove, but there are other stoves that can be made of clay. Uh, we also see the eco-friendly charcoal. And in this picture, this is a group of young farmers in Tanzania who make this eco-friendly, uh, this eco-friendly charcoal from residues from uh, the coffee plants and the old meat stock and weeds, and they are able to uh, come up with uh, such a uh, uh, such a technology that supports our households to be more sustainable. 
uh, we've seen benefits uh, using uh, like this kind of technology. We've seen that there is reduction uh, in the amount of, of firewood that is actually used by these households, which saves actually our forests. On average, some of these households use like six bunches of, of firewood per month. So with the use of these energy saving cookstoves, all that uh, is, is, is saved. Then we also see another benefit of using this uh, technology. There is a reduced workload from fetching, uh, like collecting firewood, especially for women. They normally spend two to five hours uh, a day looking for firewood. So all this time is saved and they can use it to participate in, in trainings and other activities, especially that are related to improving their, their farm to be able to uh, withstand climate change. Uh, we also see that um, it reduces uh, on the health hazards from inhaling smoke because as you can see, the cook stoves are really very efficient. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the rainwater harvesting that we implement for both domestic and production use on the farms. On the left hand side, you can see the domestic uh, water tank uh, where the, the, the woman is able to fetch clean water for household use. And on the left hand side, you can see this big water tank where water is kept for use on the farm. So this also has a lot of benefits for, for the households and gives um, households more time to engage uh, in climate smart uh, uh, activities. Uh, you, you see reduced workload from fetching water because now the water is uh, in the household. Uh, we also see a lot of reduced environmental impact from ever exploiting the water sources because as you can see this water tank on the right side, uh, all this water is for use in maybe irrigation on the farm, uh, meaning that instead of uh, depleting the swamps uh, and uh, making it uh, a, 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 an environmental uh, challenge, they instead use the rainwater that is harvested using this tank. Uh, also, we see um, that there is uh, reduced um, health problems because in most cases, our households use water that is actually polluted. And also because the water is available in the household, there is improved household hygiene. And all these have, of course, a link to adaptation of climate smart um, technologies. Because as more as households improve their hygiene, maybe they will not fall sick so often, they will be able to save money to uh, invest in their, in their farms and address some of the climate challenges. Also, as uh, households uh, reduce workload from fetching water, then they have more time to engage on the farm and adopt some of these climate smart technologies. So all these are benefits that we are seeing in the households as we implement uh, these climate smart um, technologies at household level for domestic and for farm use. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, on this slide, I wanted really to share with you some of the impacts that we have seen having uh, integrated these two components, coffee and climate and, and gender. Uh, we see more women participating in trainings and extension services, and this really enhances the knowledge on farm management. Uh, we, we are all aware that women do most of the work, especially on the farms. They do the, the weeding, they do the planting, they do most of the work on the farm, but they do it without even knowledge and skills. So when they get the opportunity to participate in this, uh, these trainings, I think it impacts on the yields and the quality of the coffee that is produced because now they have acquired the skills, the necessary skills from the trainings and they're able to access even extension services 
because they have more time now at their disposal. We also see increased adoption, adoption of um, climate smart practices, because as I already said, as women engage more in the trainings and they are the ones who do the work on the farm, so they can easily put into practice some of these uh, technologies and practices uh, that they are trained in. Initially, most of our uh, um, coffee and climate technicians uh, were complaining that we train um, farmers, but we are, don't, we are not seeing any change on the farms. But now, having known the, the reason why they see more adoption rate as more women come into the training because they go back and practice on the farms. Um, we see also um, uh, women uh, coming in to take up leadership positions in farm organizations. And we very well know that uh, women also have uh, skills, have ideas to contribute in, some of, in most of these uh, farm organizations. Uh, for example, we've seen that in, in groups where we have women uh, participating, working as treasurers in these organizations, there has been, I think, proper use of, of, of resources in most of these uh, organizations, and most of them are really progressing and uh, doing very well. Um, also, uh, because uh, women are now more involved in decision making, especially the joint planning at household level, they are able to plan for the income and they are able to save for investment uh, on the farms. They can address their household needs because they, their voice is also there in the uh, planning for the income from the coffee. And also they are able to save for, for, the, for the farms, to invest on the farms. And actually we see that in most households, when you visit their household plans, you find that they have integrated climate smart adaptation practices. They either plan to, to buy marriage, to buy fertilizer, maybe to put up a water tank, meaning that the involvement, uh, this combined joint planning and decision-making has really you know, accelerated uh, the taking on on some of these uh, adaptation options and it has at the same time addressed the household needs. Um, we also see that um, there is an integration of climate smart technologies in household plans that one I have already indicated and this has actually uh, helped to also increase on the adoption rate of these climate smart practices because now households know how to plan and they know what they need and how they need to save. And everyone in the household is sure of what their benefits are from the income from the coffee. So they all work uh, as, as a team. And um, lastly, we also see that uh, in these households, definitely there is increased uh, incomes. And these increased income, of course, are translated in improved livelihoods for these households because as they adopt good uh, uh, climate smart practices on their farms, definitely there is increased production and the production is of quality and they are able to get good uh, uh, price for their coffee, which improves the income that comes in these households. And uh, since they now uh, are able to plan for this income together, they, their livelihoods become better and, and better. Um, we can go to the next slide. Having said all this, um, what is a way forward? Um, we, we now see that it is actually very important and very key to integrate gender in all our climate change interventions. And actually, our, our livelihood approach is now very clear. Gender is the basis of all our intervention of all our interventions, because we've seen that when you include gender, you address gender constraints in climate change, uh, adaptation interventions, uh, uh, households adopt, uh, adopt these uh, interventions uh, more easily because 
everyone is working as a team in these households. Um, we also uh, see that it is very important to involve women and young people in promoting climate smart technologies. This one, they can actually do it as a business because one of the key learnings we got from uh, implementing these technologies is that uh, when we implement these technologies, we have to make sure that they are accessible, people can easily get them, and they are available, and actually they can be adopted to the local context. So if we involve women and young people to promote these uh, technologies and do it as a business, one hand, they will increase their income, which in one way, they may again invest in climate smart practices, but also it helps these households to access some of these technologies easily. Um, we also see that it's very important to provide platforms for sharing knowledge and experiences within communities to increase outreach because climate change affects the entire coffee valley chain. So it should not be the, the work of, uh, it should be the work of all stakeholders. Thank you, and I hand over to to me. Thank you very much, Fortunate, for this great presentation, which has already triggered a number of questions. I can already anticipate we're going to have a bit of a challenge to address them all. Uh, but before that, reminding everyone that since the series is around uh, comparisons, overlaps, um, similarities between the cocoa and coffee sectors, we wanted to get some cross perspectives from the cocoa sector following, uh, for, following your case study, uh, Fortunate. So Anna uh, has been working extensively in the cocoa sector. She has some questions of her own, and I think she has also been fishing some additional questions. And once she has introduced these, uh, we'd love to also get to hear from any of you participants who work specifically in the cocoa sector for additional questions you might have. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, as you probably know, I also work at KIT as, a, as an advisor on sustainable economic development and gender. Um, so thank you so much for the presentation so far. Uh, as Ewan said, uh, and Marta also at the beginning, that our objective or one of our objectives is this cross-sector learning. And um, well, if we see also the presentation uh, uh, given, we could have replaced the word coffee for cocoa rather easily and the situation would be more or less still, uh, the, the, the um, narrative would still be valid. So it also shows this, this similarities between the two uh, sectors. But what was pointed out at the beginning that I think it's fair to say that in the cocoa sector, although there are people working on both households approaches, uh, gender and on climate, uh, they have not really been uh, combined. Um, and also myself, uh, I've done a lot of work on cocoa particularly, but never uh, on that particular nexus. So we indeed try to get somebody on board who could give us that perspective. And uh, there are people working on this and, and we will also include uh, some of their work in our uh, communication following up on this webinar. Uh, one of these people is Sarah Eisler. Um, unfortunately, she could not participate, but she just finished actually her PhD in rural uh, sociology. Uh, and her, her PhD is on chocolate and climate change, and particularly looking at the gender dynamics of small-scale small cocoa producers in uh, Indonesia. And uh, she really uh, confirmed the similarities um, between the two sectors. Um, and, and one of her responses also to, to uh, the presentation by Fortunate was that, um, uh, yeah, so one of the similarities is that if we look, for example, at the case of uh, women in Indonesia involved in cocoa, we see also from their roles in the household, we see that they are uh, often involved in the post-harvest practices, and in cocoa that means also drying. The reason that women are involved uh, has to do with their limited mobility and they often stay, uh, do the work close to their homes and the drying is happening also uh, on that spot. But because of the, the uh, increasing erratic rainfall patterns, what has happened is actually the drying becomes more challenging and the cocoa beans get easily rotten. And one of their responses was to sell actually the wet beans instead of the dry beans. 
uh, which is a coping strategy, but it has also a cost because the beans that are wet are sold at a lower price. So uh, I'm, I'm very um, happy to hear positive strategies, uh, how to cope with climate change, but the reality of today is also that it affects uh, people and uh, it might, the result might be that it affects your uh, income, which is still now the case, I guess, in um, the context of Indonesia, but also in other countries. Um, so I want to give now actually the floor to the questions that are raised by the audience. And uh, if we lack questions, I'm happy to pose in a few. Thank you, Anna, for this perspective. And, and indeed, we have collected a number of questions, but wanted to check if anyone also working in the cocoa sector would like to, uh, to chip in before we proceed with the list of questions we have received. If you would like to talk uh, or to ask a question, there are actually three different ways to do this. One is to use the chat window, as some of you have been using, and uh, another one is to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And the final thing is, if you click on participants, you can actually, you get an opportunity to raise your hand and we will try and give you the floor then. So at this stage, uh, let's just take a minute to see if anyone working in the cocoa sector would like to share. I see Elvis Opong Mensa. Uh, so maybe you can either unmute yourself and uh, share your question or otherwise share it in writing with us in this chat window. Anyone else, please raise your hand if you would like to. Elvis, we should be able to hear you. You're unmuted. So maybe since this seems, can you try and speak? Okay. I think we can hear you now. Okay. So my name is Elvis of Kormesa. Uh, I work for several response. Uh, we are in Ghana. So my experience in the cocoa is not necessarily doing the projects in cocoa, but we work with communities in the cocoa growing area and in, in our interaction with them and observation. I'd like to share the experience from that perspective. So in Ghana, one major is, uh, issue with the cocoa sector and gender dynamics is our uh, land tenure system that we have. So, hello, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. So in Ghana, the problem with the, the cocoa and gender is the land tenure system that we have. So in Ghana, most of the land, so in the household, when they want to do farming, mostly is the men who becomes the owner of the cocoa farm. So when they have a piece of farm and they want to go into farming and they want to do cash crop, mostly is the men who are the owners of the cash crop. Even if women will be doing the farming, they will be planting other things like the plantains, the maize, and the cassava. So when it comes to cocoa, it's mostly the men. And because of the, the land tenure dynamics, Whenever there's a benefit from the cocoa or when there's a sale in the cocoa, it's the men who gets the money because apparently they become the owner of the cocoa farm, even though they did the work with their wives and their children. But because they are the head of the family, they are the owners of the land, they, they, they take ownership, ownership of, of, of the benefit that, can, that are derived from the cocoa. And in Ghana too, there have been a lot of interventions in the cocoa sector and the aim of these interventions are to boost the incomes of, of, of the community people. But because of the land tenure dynamics that I talked about, even though this uh, initiative is to boost the income level of the cocoa farm, and most of the intervention benefits the men because it's the men who owns the land and who owns the cocoa. So when you, get, you come out of any intervention to boost the income level of cocoa farmers, is the, is the men who eventually benefits out of it. And there's also this thing that someone, uh, he talks about when she was talking about uh, charcoal production. I think it's something that maybe we also need to learn here in Ghana because in the cocoa ports, it's possible you can use it for charcoal. But in Ghana, when they, they, they they remove the beans from the pot, they throw 
the, the cocoa pot away, which can actually be used to do, maybe it's possible it can be used to do the charcoal that uh, they were talking about, but we haven't been able to explore, explore that. And also because mostly, it also affect, uh, 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 help the women, because mostly women are engaged in charcoal production, and in engaging in charcoal production, they intend to go into the harvesting of timber species, which leads to deforestation. So there can be an initiative which will help to use these cocoa pots to do that uh, eco-friendly. Thank eco -friendly. you. Thank you very much, uh, Elvis. We're, we're just going to, uh, to open the floor to one other person, uh, Robert, uh, since you had also your, your hand raised about, uh, about this, hopefully representing the cocoa sector. And after this, we'll basically open for or address the questions we have received already so far. So Robert, over to you. Thank you again, Elvis. Thank you. And um, this is Robert O'Sullivan. I work for TetraTech on a USAID funded project in, in Ghana, the Integrated Land and Resource Governance Project. And there we've been looking at, at these issues around zero deforestation cocoa production, also trying to look at uh, land tenure issues as the previous uh, speaker just talked about, and, and also the issue of gender, and have observed many of those, those same, same dynamics. And you know, this presentation is very helpful because at the moment in our, in our program cycle, we are programming out what we're doing over the next next 12 months and trying to identify exactly these kinds of issues where we can work with women in particular around different activities that will help uh, reduce deforestation, have this link between gender, climate change and on the ground activities. Um, so hopefully maybe in 12 months time, there'll be a nice uh, cocoa study that, that can be looked at in, uh, in Ghana that'll help to uh, provide some comparative analysis for for cocoa and, and coffee. Great, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for this, uh, for this insights. Um, so from our original list of question, uh, there was a first question coming from Louise Anton asking, are there any experiences in working with local environmental NGOs and or women's rights NGOs? And I think most of the questions we have received were directed at you, uh, fortunate, but, uh, but of course, Kathy, if you want to add anything also, feel free to. Was the question clear, fortunate? Any experiences in working with local environmental NGOs and or women's rights NGOs? Um, the question is not very clear. On this very topic, uh, does she want to know the experience working with local uh, or environmental NGOs or women NGOs on this kind of uh, initiative or generally on gender issues? It was not very specific. Okay, so maybe what we can do is invite uh, Louise to uh, add on to that question. Uh, she has another question coming back later on and proceed with another question in the meantime. Uh, another question which was actually asked by a couple of participants is around the, the key performance <laughs> indicators the metrics that you have used to track and measure impact, especially around gender equality and relationships in the households, which are more difficult to capture quantitatively. So which KPIs have you used to track progress? Um, uh, we monitor, uh, we monitor uh, our gender interventions in the overall M&E system because gender is integrated in, in the entire initiative. And uh, we basically look for aspects such as uh, shared roles, both domestic and on the farm. Then we also look at um, aspects of uh, joint decision making uh, within the household. Uh, we also look at aspects like uh, women participation in trainings and in leadership. Uh, we also look at um, um, yeah, basically that's it. Okay, well, that's already quite a few measures indeed to, uh, to address this. And there was a, there's maybe a related point that Cathy might also be able to speak to from Evaristo Mapeza. Uh, gender norms take time to change. So how do you track such changes over time? So, I mean, very, very similar, but maybe Cathy also has something to, something to add or yourself, uh, fortunate. Uh, yes, I agree. Gender norms take some time to change. And uh, that one, we, we, 
also uh, try to uh, track, especially like we do uh, quarterly assessments of our household to see how they are progressing in terms of uh, addressing their, their relations. Uh, but also with these household methodologies, we have realized that actually change comes in very fast. The moment households begin to work together, to make a decision together, change happens. Um, can I come in? Yeah, please. Yes, um, just briefly, you mentioned in my introduction that I'd done research on household methodologies for about 10 years. And the main reason I became interested was that I was asked with Zambian colleagues to look at the agricultural, agricultural support program in Tanzania, which introduced a household methodology. And my colleague had worked on gender and change for 10 years. And he said, I've never seen change happen so quickly. And he said, it's just amazing. And this is really down to what um, Fortunate just said. People see the, people come to understand what the lack of cooperation can mean in a household. And they see the gains to, to cooperation really, really rapidly. And people are very sensible and rational people. It's just a question of making people aware of this. And so they see the gains quickly, gains quickly and they change. Thank you. Thank you also for this very hopeful remark and, uh, and one we can only encourage. Another question came from Najma Werdan, uh, wondering whether there had been any backlash as a result of these results, like any gender, in the case of gender-based violence or other negative repercussions. Um, from our experience, we have not seen such in, in our projects uh, because the approach that we are using brings men and women together. So we address men and women together, which minimizes some of those issues that would have uh, come. Uh, men and women uh, all come and understand why they need to change the way they have been doing things. So we've not had experiences where we've seen maybe domestic violence increase because uh, of our intervention. Thank you, Fortunate. Um, another question, I, we're receiving still more questions, which is great. And, and by the way, what I think we will try and do for the questions we cannot address is basically to try and address them bilaterally beyond this uh, webinar and, and uh, post uh, the answers uh, as part of the documentation. So we'll try and make sure that all your questions are addressed this way. The next question comes from Carl Val, wondering which climate smart agriculture technologies or practices that are specific to coffee and cocoa uh, have been adopted and whether you see a difference in adoption between men and women. Um, I think I can answer that question, but I have here uh, our climate smart expert, and he would really want to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Victor. Uh, I would like to say some of the climate smart practices that have been adopted, uh, of course, include uh, mulching. We have soil and water conservation uh, on farm. Uh, like terracing and whatever it is. Then we also have shade trees have also strongly been adopted in the uh, uh, coffee. Uh, we also have uh, improved uh, coffee varieties uh, that uh, has been uh, released by our uh, research station, uh, coffee research station. So we are also promoting it with the farmers. Uh, we have uh, integrated soil fertility management uh, the fertilizers, the organic fertilizers, uh, the conventional fertilizers, and uh, of course we also have integrated uh, pest and disease management. So it's quite, those are on-farm uh, technologies. And then of course, as fortunate say, that household level, uh, we have practices like uh, she talked about the cook stoves, she talked about the water harvesting, she talked about the, uh, those eco-friendly charcoal, so, I mean, uh, uh, their practices have actually been taken up. And uh, of course, we can't say there has been adoption between the men and women because they are working together as a holistic household uh, unit. So whatever they, they make joint decisions 
uh, they plan together, you know, so whatever options are taken up by the firm, we believe it's a collective decision that has been taken, not an individual, either a man or a woman taking decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Victor, for these uh, additions. I didn't know that uh, Fortunate had come with a backup team. This is really, really great to see. We have uh, a next question that we collected from Kimberly Eason, uh, also enthusiastically saying great work and wondering what is the cost per farmer or per family member for this series of trainings that you talked about? And is there a measure of productivity, quality and supply consistency that can be tracked as business benefits for the, former, for the farmer organization? as well as the obvious livelihood development impact stated here. So is there a measure of productivity, quality and supply consistency you've used? What is the cost per farmer or per family member for this series of trainings? Tough question. Yeah, uh, I would say uh, it depends on the extension system that actually uh, each individual organization is using because uh, ours is a farmer-led extension system. And uh, of course we do a TOT, train of trainers for our farmer extensionists who in turn go into their farmer groups at village level, invite them together and then they have these trainings. So, and it is a voluntary uh, farmer-led extension system. So the cost of uh, training is actually something which is as minimum as uh, possible on our side. Uh, then, um, I don't know if I got the second question correctly about measuring efficiency and all that. Uh, Fortunate already mentioned that we do quite uh, a number of uh, M&E monitoring and evaluation and learning activities uh, on a quarterly basis. And then we also do, uh, you know, on annual basis, we also assess the effectiveness of the farmer organizations to see how they have adopted these practices. We do checks at household level. You know, we also do on-farm checks to see the quality of the work that they are doing, and that informs our cyclic process of uh, the coffee and climate approach. So depending on the findings that we have, then we can be able to replan together with these uh, farm organizations, farmer groups, and the individual farmers, households, to see what the next steps can be. Great. Thank you again, Victor. And Fortunate or Kathy, if you ever, yeah, if you want to add on, please feel free to. Um, I'm otherwise moving on to a next question uh, by Louise Anton also. We have also received a compliment from your first question, Louise, so we, we may uh, proceed with that a bit later. <clears throat> how, how could these great findings also benefit the signatories to the International Responsible Business Agreement on Food Products, if you are familiar with it? Anyone? And if you have no answer, it is also perfectly legitimate. It may not be an answer that you can give also now. We can also park that question and come back to it uh, bilaterally afterwards. Um, so another question coming from Sally Smith, wondering uh, whether the approach has been used in different country contexts and, and gender contexts, and whether this has made a difference to outcomes. Um. Uh, yes, we, we have used uh, this approach in different contexts. As I mentioned, uh, the first C, uh, Coffee and Climate Initiative was implemented in Central America, Brazil, Tanzania, and Vietnam. And our integrated approach uh, is integrated, it was implemented in Tanzania and Central America. And uh, we've seen that it makes a very dif a big difference on the outcomes. As I mentioned, uh, we've seen that households that have adopted, uh, it has increased their production, has increased the quality of the coffee they, they produce. So we see that actually uh, there's uh, no big difference in the different country contexts when it comes to outcomes, because we implement the same approach in all these uh, uh, countries uh, the only difference uh, is on the, the technologies, which we really have to contextualize depending on the, the, the context in the different countries. But our gender household approach uh, elements that we integrate in the coffee and climate are similar in the different regions where we work. And we've seen that uh, 
the, 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 the great outcomes from, from, from these uh, initiatives in terms of production, in terms of the quality of coffee that is produced. Thank you, Fortunate. An extrapolation from this question comes from Katie Sims wondering, do you think other sectors are similar? Uh, so in other words, is this actually an issue for general women in general? For rural women in general, sorry. Yeah, I think gender issues cut across and uh, you, they are quite similar, be it in the coffee, be it maybe in the banana, be it in any other rural context. So I think this approach is applicable for mm. any rural a woman, in a rural context, because you find that most of these uh, communities, uh, the gender context is actually quite similar to what I have been talking about. Yeah, and uh, maybe to add, uh, we've tried uh, a lot through different platforms to share uh, the approach that we are using, uh, both at local level, and I think uh, national level and also international level different platforms. So we have also seen uh, different uh, organizations uh, taking up this approach that we are talking about and using it in different value chains. So besides coffee, besides cocoa, it's really an approach that can be taken up because almost the crop value chains are actually affected by climate change. Yeah. And so if you also look at the different uh, gender household issues in the different uh, rural context, they seem to be similar. So this is an approach that actually can be used uh, in different contexts. Thank you, Victor. And, uh, and we are also to answer a question uh, by Cathy. We are also looking at a Q&A. Uh, quite a few questions have been asked there. One of them was from Eugenia B asking, which policies and strategies can be implemented to improve gender equality in agriculture in the face of climate change, especially in Southern Africa? And at what cost will the policies and strategies be to A, nation and B, communities? We have really some tough questions, but so far you've been doing a sterling job at, uh, at answering them. So we keep coming. Um, I think before you come up with any policy or any strategy, you must first understand the context. So I would suggest that maybe uh, before uh, we suggest any policies or strategies that can be used in Southern Africa, we need to first of all understand, maybe carry out maybe an assessment to really understand the context and identify maybe uh, the clear uh, adoption path, adoption strategies that would be used uh, in that particular context. Because you cannot uh, uh, suggest a policy or a strategy before you really understand uh, the situation at hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I would maybe answer, answer this question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fortunate. Again, uh, we're going to actually ask you maybe the final question uh, before we proceed with a sort of closure with, uh, with Anna. Uh, the, this question comes from Han Tran asking, I would like to ask if gender and climate change is just an issue in developing countries that you mentioned, or do so-called developed countries also face the issues of gender and climate change? Question is to all speakers. Yeah. Hello. Kathy, take it away. Um, I, have, I haven't actually done much research on gender and climate change issues um, in the global north, but there are clear, clear issues. And I think one thing that's quite interesting is that northern farming systems are very male dominated in most cases. Um, but what you do see if you look at the literature, and I come from a very rural background myself, is that a lot of women, more than men, are involved in sustainable and ecological farming systems. Um, but of course, men are also getting involved uh, more and more in climate smart farming in northern countries, and um, women are as well. But there are gender issues in farming, definitely in northern countries, which go far beyond um, climate smart issues themselves. And they relate to who owns the land, who inherits the land, who is expected to be a farmer, who is reached by the extension services. Quite a few of these issues are the same actually in northern countries. It's just we talk less about them. Thank you, Kathy. 
Fortuna, would you like to add anything to this? No, I think Kase has really answered the, the question because I don't have a lot of experience or so in uh, Global North, so I may not be in position to answer this question. Great, thank you. It sounds like uh, anyway, a potentially very interesting uh, arena to explore further. So to the Susanna, Dora, Francesca, Lydia, Louise, Caroline, Carl, and I'm probably missing a few. We have your questions. We will get back to you uh, as part of the documentation. Before I hand over to Anna, I would like to really thank, in any case, uh, yourselves, Francesca, uh, Francesca, fortunate, and Victor and Kathy for an excellent job at uh, presenting your experiences, the general framework, and also answering these difficult questions of various kinds. Now let me hand over to Anna. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, sticking with us. Um, it turns out that Zoom is actually very climate smart technology, bringing us all together, uh, having this exchange without actually needing to travel. So um, we have more than 80 participants uh, today, so we are very, uh, uh, very happy with that result. Um, just to wrap up quickly and, and uh, share some next steps. Now, what is clear, of course, that the climate crisis uh, affects everyone, but um, men and women can be affected differently, even if they're part of the same household. So one of the words that stood out is uh, uh, household cooperation. Uh, household cooperation is key. Um, and I think it's very uh, encouraging to hear that a household approach in combination with uh, certain technologies, etc., can create change faster than we may uh, maybe have expected. Uh, and it can work such an approach, approach uh, in different contexts and also for different value chains. And with that, uh, I want to, to bridge to our next webinar. Uh, we have planned the next webinar in uh, one month from now, on the 24th of March. And uh, our idea is to include also um, tea as a sector uh, in this webinar and to see if we can expand uh, our knowledge and our exchange and to do, do some cross fertilization between the three commodities, uh, the three uh, uh, crops and um, livelihoods. Uh, so we really look forward to, to that and we will keep you uh, posted on um, the program and uh, we will of course send the invite to everyone. Then uh, what is also important and just repeating, uh, Ewan, is that we will make available the recordings and we also come up with a summary of the webinar. Um, so we will make sure you, you have that. We have your uh, uh, addresses, but we also post it uh, on our website and in the, uh, on social media. So I'm sure uh, we will reach you. Um, I think that is the last. So if there are not any other comments from my uh, colleagues, I would like to thank again everyone. And we hope to welcome you at the next webinar and have a great rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And